Okay, uh, welcome to the Ipanema Scientific Online Lecture number six. Uh, it is titled the uh, Miniaturizing Photonic Instruments for Sensing and uh, it will be given by Professor Ibrahim Abdul Halim, a professor from uh, Ben Gurion University and the head of the Photonic SIS um, company, which is the member of Ipanema Consortium. So, uh, Ibrahim, please, let's hear your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Ivana, and good afternoon to everyone. First of all, let me know if you hear me very well. Yes. Good. Okay, so based on the request and also my original proposal for a topic, it's about miniaturizing photonic instruments for sensing. Um, the best example is what we have in photonic SIS, the miniature SPR, but I will be talking about uh, general, the general trend of miniaturizing photonic instruments, particularly using cell phones and why we are doing it, the motivation, and some other activities we are doing, which, uh, which has a great potential or miniaturized uh, systems. So first of all, let me say something about optics. Why optical biosensors or photonic biosensors? I mean, the concept of biosensing, I guess everybody knows that. We don't need this, the light uh, source, the analyte, the optical transducer, and the detector. We were in optics, uh, we have, let's say we have a plane wave, like we call it, which is uh, represented by this simple wave function, let's say, where I omega t plus I k dot r basically determines the phase. Now we can talk about temporal or spatial frequencies. Temporal are omega, like the ones we know. The spatial is less known, mainly for optics people, which means the k vectors, means the angles. So if we translate k, for example, into angle, it will be like 2 pi over lambda times the refractive index times sine of the angle could be cosine, depend uh, the definition of the angle. But it determines, K determines the direction of the propagation. So it's called a uh, spatial frequency because sometimes we don't have only one spatial frequency. We can have many of them. Like when we focus a beam, we will have many angles. Or when the beam is diverging, we will have many angles as well. Why is that good? For example, when doing spectroscopy, we have many omega. We use a parallel detector, so we get a spectrometer. So why, why not do the same if we have many k vectors? Like we have many angles, we have a parallel detector like a camera, then we can detect many angles. So we also have a spatial frequency uh, spectrometer. Okay, and we are talking about, usually with sensors, we're talking about a change in the signal, could be versus angle, versus wavelength, like a resonance or color, or maybe the refractive index is changing, so the spectrum is changing, and we can measure the position of the resonance, uh, like the resonance wavelength, the angle, and we correlate it with the refractive index, or we can measure intensity, the variation in the intensity. Another important parameter, which we just mentioned, the phase, it's very important because, <coughs> sorry, sometimes it shows a very sharp change particularly when you have a resonance, a 
like with the SPR, or could be any other guided mode resonance and so on. Then at the resonance, you have a sharp jump in the face, usually one pi or two pi phase shift. So the resonance itself might be broad and difficult to determine its minimum. I mean, it gives you a larger error. But when you look at this steep variation, then you can imagine that you will get a more accurate measurement if you can measure the face. So that's why we use a variety of techniques, sometimes to measure wavelengths, sometimes uh, angle, sometimes intensity, and sometimes face. So we can use ellipsometry or polarimetry. Ellipsometry, everybody knows, I guess. There are ellipsometers everywhere. They measure the polarization of the wave and the phase difference between the two main polarizations. You know, usually it's uh, the light has two main polarizations, let's say left or right circular polarization, or we can talk about horizontal and vertical. In the language of physicists, it's more called transverse electric, like TE or TM, transverse magnetic. But there are always two orthogonal polarizations. And the phase change between the two orthogonal components determines the polarization state by the end. So its measurement is very important. And as with ellipsometry, from this measurement, we get thicknesses of layers. We can get refractive index. So we can correlate it, for example, in solution correlated with concentration, and it can measure resonance location if we have a phase jump uh, and many, many other parameters. With absorption spectroscopy, it's usually the variation in the intensity because of absorption could be resonant, so you can measure a spectrum and the shift in the spectrum or variation in the intensity Sometimes it has also polarization dependence. With the scattering could be elastic or non-elastic. We will talk about the non-elastic as well, like Raman scattering, but could also be elastic scattering, like Rayleigh scattering. So some companies are now detecting bacteria from the scattering pattern uh, from a bacteria or uh, a collection of bacteria. So you can look at the intensity, it's angular spread, wavelength dependence, and sometimes polarization dependence. There is something called correlation length, uh, which means how strong is the scattering, actually. And all these can give you information on the scattering object. It's used a lot also in uh, diagnosis. You want to do a diagnosis of the skin or any other tissue, we look mainly at scattering because light cannot penetrate, is not transparent except through the eye, but other tissue is mainly scattering. Of course, resonances like the surface plasma resonance, guided wave resonance, and many other effects like with photonic crystal and uh, uh, whispering gallery modes, uh, fabry perot resonances, and so on. These are used because they are resonances, they are sensitive to variations in the refractive index. So they can be used for biosensing. And again, we can measure intensity, phase, peak position, polarization, uh, and so on. And then there is the emission, could be luminescence or fluorescence. Uh, we measure usually the intensity if it's fluorescence. Sometimes if it's narrow enough, we are also measuring wavelength. And it can have some polarization dependence if the molecules are anisotropic. 
And another important parameter is the lifetime, which can give more specificity on the molecule and the environment where this molecule is emitting. And of course, Raman scattering is inelastic because you will have a frequency shift from the laser frequency. And here, in principle, we can measure peak position. Unfortunately, with many of the organic materials where we are interested in, the peak position is not changing much. It's mainly the intensity, sometimes maybe polarization. Why? Because most of the organic molecules are made from CC, CH, CN, CS, and so on. So these are uh, the majority of the peaks are quite similar and difficult to find a specific peak for a specific uh, uh, pollutant. Sometimes we are lucky and we can do it, but in general, it has to rely on intensity of product. And so on and so on. There are many effects, many uh, phenomena, diffraction, interference. There are many companies now doing interferometric uh, biosensors, having two beams and interfering them together then because of the phase change, this phase here, the refractive index changes the phase. So it will change the interference pattern. And from that, we can detect the concentration. It can be very sensitive because you can make the path length very large. So if the path length is very large, R, let's say, is very large, then you can have large phase variation even if n is small, like very small one. So it means you increase your detection limit by increasing the path length. Um, of course, each one has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we will not go into many details because we need to show other things as well. But the idea here is that we have many optical effects to be implemented for biosensing. And the main motivation, I think, is I see the, the column of the pictures here on the screen. Maybe it will be also recorded. Maybe you can remove it somehow. Ivana? Hello? Yes. I'm saying the column of the pictures is on my screen. Maybe it will be recorded. Uh, no, I, I um, made it smaller, so it's okay. It's not being recorded. Okay, okay. because it's hiding uh, some of the, the things here. Okay, so the motivation is, I think, very clear because of the latest developments in miniature components, which can uh, detect light in a very sensitive way. Uh, they are relatively cheap, like mini cameras, imaging sensor, other sensors could be one dimensional. Uh, we can make them spectral, for example, using these patterns, uh, mask, what's called color masks or uh, spectral masks on top of the sensor. You can measure many wavelengths in parallel, not necessarily color. You lose the resolution, but it is possible. You can make it polarimetric because for polarimetric measurement, all you need is three, three polarization states, vertical, horizontal, and 45. Sometimes since you can make it symmetric, you can add another one at minus 45, it will improve the measurement. So if you put this on top of the camera, you can also create a polarimetric camera. Again, you lose some resolution because now each four pixels will, will correspond to one pixel, but you don't always need the resolution. 
Uh, of course, light sources, variety of light sources, LEDs with high power, uh, even uh, halogen or uh, small incandescent lamps, um, laser diodes, which are very miniature. They can, they can come even in high power and packaged with a thermoelectric cooler, what's called a butterfly package. And you can add to them the power supply and they're still uh, very compact. Uh, you can make a compact probe for Raman or fluorescence. I will show one which we are using and how it is built usually. You can have a miniature electronics with the uh, cards like the Raspberry Pi or the Arduino, which is basically like a computer. It has internet and uh, USB connections, can connect to many electronic devices, as you see here, um, and programmed and so on. And of course, there are many other uh, optical components which can be used, like micro lenses, uh, micro prisms, and so on. Of course, the cell phone is the most the horsepower these days. How to make uh, miniature devices on a mobile, because it also exists almost with uh, everybody these days. Spectrometers, even the what we call the which can give continuous spectrum, they are becoming very miniature. Uh, almost each company now, a spectroscopy company now doing them. Uh, this is Hamamatsu, I think. This is Ocean Optics. And they are like uh, less than two, two centimeters. You pay a little on the resolution and sometimes the uh, spectral range, but it's still okay compared to the price goes down from the usual spectrometers like $1,500 to $2,000, and these ones are like $300. I'm sure if you buy them in large quantities, they will be much less even. It can sit on a chip. You can make spectral measurements and make a sensor. Uh, in imaging, there are many other uh, developments like the spatial light modulator, the modulator which is pixelated, like what's called the liquid crystal or MEMS-based devices. They are used, for example, with head-mounted displays and, and uh, projection displays. Um, and uh, today with the AR and VR technologies, they also considered like the, the main component there, which brings the, uh, basically the image and project it, and then a person can see it on a screen, on a, like, a, like a Google a type device. And there is a lot of interest in this device for imaging applications. You can do holographic imaging with it, uh, you can do structure illumination, you can do polarization imaging, face imaging, and many, many other applications. And of course, there are emerging uh, tunable lenses, both made from liquids and sometimes also liquid crystals, just emerging, the liquid crystal ones, where you can change the focus uh, with a very small voltage and then you can also combine it with other lenses to make a zoom lens for example and this is i think it, it, it is still under development but it will be coming soon and will have a variety of uh, applications connected to a cell phone uh, and so on so there is a lot of motivation why to do miniature devices there is more, of course, for example, fabrication, uh, 
at the micro and nano scale using e-beam, DBUV, X-rays, nano imprinting, 3D printing, and so on. They all become available. Plasmonic enhancement can help improving the signal, fluorescence, Raman, or infrared scattering. So you can use miniature devices and you don't need the big bulky uh, devices to detect, uh, let's say, a small concentration of molecules. And there are a powerful tools for design and computation, which you can use it quite easily in developing a variety of techniques and put it in a, a small uh, format, like using console, Oslo, Lomerical, and so, and so on. You can design structures then fabricate them, and then reading them with a miniature spectrometer. And uh, many algorithms are coming, which improve also the main purpose of them, actually miniaturization, like what's called computational imaging, which means I don't need the full imaging system Maybe I will use only one lens and one mask, but I will use a lot of computation to extract the image. And there are ways to do it. I don't maybe need a camera with very large number of pixels, and I can compensate for the resolution using computational algorithms. Some of them are called compressed sensing, some called, called deep learning, artificial intelligence, neural nets, and so on. Um, oh, I have this one twice for some reason. <laughs> okay, uh, I talked about this. And besides, there is a need for, for these miniature sensors to go to the clinic, to the house, to individuals, maybe to go over the skin for health purposes, like fast diagnosis, real-time diagnosis, fast detection of pathogens or toxic materials, biomarkers, and so on. For environmental detection, industry, like pharma, optical metrology, machines production, and so on, they all require fast and miniature equipment. And of course, food inspection, like food equality, agriculture, pathogens, pesticides, or fraud in food uh, trading or selling and so on. Of course, if you are interested, there is a lot of business around making uh, miniature devices miniature photonic devices. So there is a lot of motivation. I think the smartphone is it's an ideal case for miniaturization. Why? Because it has a camera with a high, um, with very good uh, performance, large number of pixels and so on. With a single lens, it's able to give us very high quality images. It has a light source, an LED, quite bright. And of course, we can use the processor inside and use the communication. So we can build a sensor either using the cell phone itself. And I will show some examples, for example, color sensor. So this the cell phone already giving color images. We can measure color then with some uh, software, write the application to analyze the color and give you more quantitative measurement. Or you can connect it to analytic device, a miniature one, which you will build it, maybe with a miniature spectrometer and can be attached directly to the cell phone or you can interface it with a fiber, or if it's electrical, we are not talking about electrical here, but uh, possible also with uh, electrochemical sensors, 
Here we are talking about possibility of taking the light with LED and maybe taking the reflected or scattered light back to the camera as a detector. Not necessarily to see an image, but as a detector. So there are many uh, possibilities uh, using the cell phone. So that's why I will try to concentrate on the cell phone optics. And here we show some examples for bioimaging using simply a bright field. This one simply uses the camera as a chip. You simply remove the lens. And if you put your object on top of the, uh, on top of the chip itself, then you will start seeing actually the each pixel will see will show you one point which will have a different light right light intensity so all together will form an image in order to go, to get a better image like better resolution they did some shifting of the uh, mobile phone so you, by shifting, you can actually reconstruct, take many images uh, after uh, each shift, and then analyze them and build the final image. This is an example of uh, some microorganisms in water. Um, you, it sounds crazy to put water on top of the chip, but I'm sure it can be improved more. For example, put a very thin layer to protect the chip and it will uh, still work. This one called the contact microscope or contact scope, it uses a taper, it's like a piece of a glass with this shape. And if you put one, your object here, it will be, the light will be guided and you can image uh, using other two lenses to the cell phone, or maybe one lens and the other one is the cell phone lens. So it's just making it um, like a microscope, because if you go very close to the, you cannot go very close to the uh, cell phone lens, uh, the image will be uh, defocused. So you need some distance but then you will get the magnification. If you want some magnification, you have to add some additional optics. Usually adding one more lens is, is good enough. I will show some more examples later. This one shows, um, uh, sorry, some applications of detecting, for example, uh, kind of warm in water or bacteria microorganisms and it has a capillary or a chip it's all a 3 3d printed case and um, some electronics using arduino and as you can see it's uh, about the size of the cell phone maybe less in terms of uh, the lateral dimensions so it's a small box and you can use it to image uh, microorganisms. The same here, it uses, in this case, it uses a light source, which is external LEDs. It has diffuser to make the light more uniform. And the sample is sitting here. And uh, you can image it with the symbol and so on and so on. This one again shows LED with diffuser, sample holder. Uh, yeah, we talked about this, sorry. And this one is doing holographic on-chip uh, uh, imaging. So the holographic imaging, you need some, it depends how you do it, but there are ways to do it without uh, doing the classical what's called the classical holographic imaging to do to have interference between two beams. 
You can do it, for example, using uh, SLM with a mask, uh, variety of other techniques, uh, even without using uh, lenses. So you can make it very compact and you do the imaging and processing with the cell phone. What's good about holographic, it gives you actual information about the face and the face, then you can build a three-dimensional image. Right? Of course, you can do fluorescence. All it needs, simply shining with the excitation light, like blue LED. In this case, it's a dark field LED. And it shines here through a capillary, and you look at the emitted light use a emission filter you look at the emitted light it's all contact connected here to the uh, cell phone there are many other schemes of course some people use the light source of the, um, the cell phone itself and a filter and then excitation filter if you use a plasmonic substrate you will have a large signal so the incident light from the led of the of the cell phone will be enough to give you a fluorescent signal for example with the nanoparticles or any other uh, plasmonic uh, enhancement uh, substrates okay Turning a smartphone into digital microscope, we just saw it, but here the idea is that you will be able to get something with high magnification. Because usually the cell phone can do demagnification. And if you can come close enough, you get uh, maybe one to one magnification almost one-to-one, -one. at most. Otherwise, it becomes defocused. So the way to do it, you simply add a lens. But to get quite high magnification, I mean, you can do it by adding an objective maybe, but the objective is quite expensive and it's bulky. So people started doing that with micro lenses. And in this case, quite nice approach using simply liquid droplets by simply using uh, different quantities of the liquid through a pipette. You can create variety of lens diameters. They are plano convex. And now you image the object to one plane, let's say to here, you will get some magnification uh, it's a simple lens, so this lens law applies. Okay, one over the distance of the object plus one over the distance of the image equal to one over the focal length. Now the second lens from the cell phone will take this as an object and image it to the sensor. So the same law applies and if you combine them, you will get that the magnification is actually determined by, for each lens is the ratio between the image distance to the object lens distance. We have two lenses, so we get multiplication of the two. Uh, we can simplify it to get this expression. As we said for the cell phone, when we image from nearby, magnification is almost one so we don't need to worry about this it's mainly this this term which gives us the magnification and we can as you can see you can make it quite high if we put the object very near the the, fo the focal plane okay then the denominator becomes small and we get high magnification so they prove it and it's shown here. This is uh, onion epidermis cells imaged using the 
smartphone, I think one millimeter diameter lens, and compared with the Nikon 20X 0.75 uh, NA, is not bad at all. And this is another example. Some other use the ball lens. Ball lenses are simply like spherical lens, and it's one millimeter diameter. As you can see here, these are blood, uh, I think blood cells. And you can see quite high resolution at the center because it's highly curvature. <coughs> you will see what's called field curvature. So it is blared, um, a lot of aberration in the periphery. To avoid that, you can do it with a lens which doesn't have this problem, like a green lens. But it, this lens, it, uh, it's based on what's called the gradient index, or the refractive index, varies along the diameter uh, almost uh, like R squared. And um, Contrary to standard lenses where we vary the radius, here it's the same radius, but we vary the refractive index. It is miniature, it's, you can make it uh, to collimate, to focus, and so on. Used a lot with the optical co communication to connect fiber to fiber or lens to fiber and so on. So with this lens, they get quite good image over wide field of view, but as you can see in the center, it's this good than this one. So if we improve the field of this lens, it will give us a very nice, um, a very nice image over a large field of view. And it can be done. Of course, it needs, uh, needs some design for example, some people use, uh, to improve the field of view of a uh, cell phone, you simply use what's, what's called fish eye lens, yeah? which can be attached to the cell phone and improve the field of view when you, in particular, when you want to take images from nearby where you get some distortion. So improving the field is possible with some additional optics. Okay, as mentioned, color detection is straightforward. The sensor is already having the three color, color pixels. And there are many color sensors that we can use or detect with the cell phone. For example, this one used detection of ammonia gas emitted from bacteria, which is uh, in order to use it for uh, what's called to determine the post-mortem interval from a body, a dead body. And the sensor itself, uh, it's more chemistry and not much uh, good in it, but it uses this material, which when attached to ammonia, it turns to more bluish. Originally, it's like uh, yellowish, it turns to bluish. So based on the color, how much, depending, you can analyze the color, maybe calculate the hue, saturation, or brightness. I think they calculated the brightness by the end, and they found quite nice correlation between the concentration and the brightness. Um, you can see why the color change here from the spectrum, originally absorbed at 412. Then when you add the ammonia, it starts to absorb also at 586. And of course you need the processing, you need to make it properly so that the light source will not affect the measurement. So maybe you want to use your own light source, which does not change, put it inside a box and so on. 
there are many color sensors as we know maybe we can also try to do the same to give more quantitative measurement and not necessarily not only yes and no sensor for example with the pregnant pregnancy test maybe it's important to say uh, for how long the lady was pregnant this shows some other plasmonic sensors using nanoparticles to detect uh, uh, like metals in water and this is detecting hepatitis uh, C virus and this is uh, one of the earlier earlier papers which appeared when, when the corona uh, started back in January or March it's a lateral flow sensor placed on bio, the biomarker. So maybe it is possible even to quantify the bacteria by looking at the color, uh, doing a more quantitative measurement. Of course, you can do more if you do a spectrum. If you measure a complete spectrum, not only a color. And the way to do it as we know, we need to disperse the light, the white light, into its components and then measure the components. So the camera is helping us because it's a parallel detector. So it gives all the components at the same time. And the way to disperse the light is using dispersing element like a prism well known from Newton's, Newton's days and the grating, the diffraction grating could be reflecting uh, but also could be transmitting and transmitting can fit very well the cell phone because you will simply put it on top of the of the lens. I will show it soon but first, let's talk a little about the principle of this. There is a very nice movie on YouTube, on YouTube which explaining how to make, how to turn a smartphone into spectrometer. Even recommended for uh, school, school teachers or college, college students and so on. So a diffraction grating, if the light is incident at normal incidence to the grating, then we know this from diffraction law, Bragg law, that D, the distance uh, or the period, times the sine of the angle, the diffracted angle. M is like diffraction order, equal to M times lambda. Usually we are interested to have the first order. The second order is more actually disturbing, okay? So if we, in order to avoid, first of all, the like M equal plus or minus, so we have plus or minus here from both directions. We can come and also to avoid the light, which is not diffractive, particularly with the transmission grating it might not be as good as the reflection one because the contrast and the way it is made the contrast between the lines and the spaces is not very large so we come at an angle and then you get this this diffraction let's say first order in this direction directly to the lens of the uh, cell phone which then will be focused on the chip. If you have the sample here, then you will be measuring basically uh, the spectrum. Transmission gratings exist from many companies, but Edmonds Optics are well known to offer a uh, <coughs> variety of components for schools and educational purposes at low cost. If you buy them in large quantity, like 100, it might become less than one dollar. They are not uh, perfect, but they are good enough. They have what's called 500 line pairs 
per millimeter. So this is around like two micron period, which is not bad. It will give a resolution depending on the pixel size, but uh, maybe few nanometer resolution, which is not bad at all. Uh, so this is a scheme and how it looks like. You can use external light like LED, or you can use the same light from the cell phone as you see it here, maybe with a fiber and coming from top and looking with the front camera, not necessarily the, the back one. And then uh, as mentioned, we needed to come at an angle. Of course, you can use uh, a lens to collimate the light, or you simply use a slit, a very small slit. Because you use a slit, means the slit will, will select a small range of angles, so you will not have a large divergence as it arrives to the grating. Okay, then you have the diffraction and the lens will focus it to the uh, sensor. It's very simple, can be made in a very small box and you have a spectrometer, but at least better than, much better than detecting only the color. This is an example of uh, such a spectrometer at the screen you will see this uh, rainbow which you need to analyze of course you can do calibration uh, <clears throat> to determine the exact uh, whatever transmission absorption reflection through the sample and this is an example of a spectrum of uh, 20 micromolar of methylene blue okay yeah, it needs some uh, what's called uh, like writing an application on, on the cell phone. Okay, but sometimes we need to do imaging, not only to get the spectrum. And it will be nice to have the, the spectrum at each pixel. So this is called the spectral imaging. In order to, to do, uh, let's say, many wavelengths, that's called the hyperspectrum, there are a variety of techniques, usually tunable filters, and some of them are compact these days, like using MEMS, Fabry Perot based on MEMS, uh, or other types of uh, MEMS are relatively miniature, liquid crystal based. Uh, filters are also miniature. And here people used uh, LEDs, LEDs simply, eight LEDs to turn a cell phone into a multispectral dermoscope. It's not hyperspectral, but in fact, if you think about it, you don't always need the hyperspectral information. One good example is in oximetry. When we go to emergency or to the clinic, the first thing they measure our oxygen saturation with an optical cable or electrical cable, but an optical head, and it uses two wavelengths. Although the spectrum is continuous and rich of information, but two wavelengths is enough. From that, they can determine the oxygen concentration. So well, this is a nice application where you don't need the hyperspectral information. And this helps you make the instrument miniature and low cost. The same here, I think the main idea is already many years, but they demonstrated it using a cell phone Usually you need a few wavelengths in the visible to determine chromophores, chromophores in the skin. You have a skin mole, which is suspicious of being cancer. Then there are a variety of 
chromophores like melanin with a high concentration and so on. And you can determine that by measuring in the visible. And the infrared, the near infrared, can penetrate deeper and give information on deep layers and maybe it's also on water content. So from these eight or nine wavelengths, you can build a device for uh, skin diagnosis, skin cancer diagnosis. Okay, uh, it's quite simple. They designed, they used eight LEDs in a like annular configuration because you will be collecting a scattering. So the light will be incident at an angle and you collect the emitted or the scattered light at the center, okay, along the normal. And then you can turn each one uh, in sequentially and take uh, the eight images. You will have multispectral images. Then you need to analyze and maybe correlate with the disease. Then you will have an application. So I will arrive to it's a good time to arrive to my activities, which um, some of them are miniaturized products. Some are have a great potential to become uh, miniaturized uh, products. So in short, I will try to make it short. I work on LC devices, use them for optical imaging, and I also work for optical on optical sensors, mainly plasmonic ones, and some the what's called extended plasmons, propagating plasmons, or localized one with nano nanoplasmonics for cells and cells. Just a short introduction on liquid crystals. They are made of anisotropic molecules. They have to be anisotropic to form liquid crystal, usually elongated. And in a device, they are simply between two glass plates with electrodes. And we put alignment layers. These are usually polymers or polyimides, which are or would have some orientation. We produce it either with polarized UV light or by mechanical rubbing in one direction. And this will help the molecules align at certain direction. This means like producing a, a monocrystal, because if without the alignment, you will get many regions aligned differently. So the device will not, fall, will not be good. So this is as simple as it looks. It can be altogether less than two millimeters thick. <coughs> In fact, with displays, for example, with LCDs, the glass thickness is only 0.7 millimeter. And the liquid crystal itself is only a few microns. And with this one, one of the nice properties of liquid crystals is that you apply small voltage and the molecules start to rotate and they tend to, to align along the, along the electric field applied. And you can do that continuously. So you have a device with variable refractive index, but because the molecules are anisotropic, you actually have two refractive indices, the one along the molecule and one perpendicular. So you have a, what we call biofringence and phase retardation, gamma, between two polarizations, the one along X and one along Y, which means the polarization will change as it goes out of the device. So we can measure polarization we can measure phase retardation because the phase retardation depends on the wavelengths, as you see here, you get color. So 
We can measure color also. Not only that, you have a strong electro-optic effect. You can build filters out of it. You can control the polarization, do polarimetric imaging, control the phase or intensity, and do aberrations, corrections, what's called adaptive optics, fringe projection, phase shift interferometry, face masks, tunable lenses, and so on. And also surprisingly, there's a quite uh, expanding field called liquid crystal biosensors, how it works, because liquid crystals are very sensitive to the surrounding. I mean, if I put a virus here on the surface, this molecule will be oriented differently. As a result, all the molecules in this surrounding will be different from this one. So it means if I have, in this case, this is a nice demo. First of all, you put the liquid crystal between two cross polarizers, even without voltage, then you get dark. In this case, the molecules are perpendicular. So you get dark, but if you have something inside, in the place where it is, it will deform the structure. As a result, the light will start leaking through the output analyzer because you get some light on a dark background, you actually get a very high signal to noise ratio. So you'll be able to detect uh, small concentrations. That's one way of, do it, of doing it. Many other modes rely more on having the uh, let's say the um, pollutant atta to attach to the surface by putting, let's say, uh, a, let's say a receptor layer, specific sensing layer on top of the, the surface, one of the surfaces or the two surfaces, and then you will let the material, the analyte with the medium flow. Once you have the analyte the pesticide attached to the surface, you look at the uh, device between, let's say, between polarizers. Sometimes you even don't need the polarizers. In some modes, like cholesteric liquid crystals, you don't need the polarizers. You will see variation either in the light intensity or the color. So you can at least make a yes-no type sensor. And of course, if you use it with a cell phone, maybe you can build a miniature biosensor using liquid crystal. I didn't work on this yet, surprise. But I work in other things, for example, polarization controllers, tunable filters, and here we came with this approach of doing multispectral type filters. We can tune between each band separately with the advantage that it will be faster, higher throughput, and we can select the bands to be very narrow. Okay? So that's... Um, a big advantage over continuously tunable filters. The continuously tunable ones which exist in, uh, in the market, they are expensive, the throughput, the light throughput is low, like 30%, and they are usually slow. We also work on SLMs with small number of pixels to do a variety of functions in imaging. For example, extending the depth of field, also doing some uh, tunable focusing. Uh, together with we, uh, combining the polarization control with the filter, we build this uh, relatively miniature, we will make it more miniature device. It's handheld at least, <clears throat> in which we can select the wavelength and then vary the polarization. So we get both 
spectral and polarimetric information on the light, in this case for skin cancer detection. And we get even very good results using two, originally using two wavelengths, but many polarizations. Now we are going to do it with nine wavelengths and many polarizations. We'll make it more compact. Maybe it will work with silicon as well. This is another nice co concept which uses a single liquid crystal device. So it's a very miniature, like two millimeters thick. Uh, you can put it on the front of a cell phone, but you will need to use what we mentioned before, a lot of computation called compressed sensing approach. So you use the information on the modulation of the, vo of the spectrum vo versus voltage, and based on that, you can extract the spectrum or any spectrum coming from any object. It requires it's a quite heavy computation. Of course, there are many other things with it. You need to do calibration properly and so on. Several papers are published. I hope that it will come into to become a product uh, very soon. So with this in mind, we are trying to commercialize these tunable filters. They can be used with uh, fluorescence, fluorescence microscopes to select the excitation light and the emission light, for example. Uh, they are compact. I mean, the filter itself is uh, about this size, like a few centimeters. Uh, here they are packaged and you can see already uh, less than uh, five centimeters each one. <coughs> and in addition, we built this uh, tunable achromatic wave plate, which is also very compact and can tune phase retardation in different levels over wide, air, wide range. And this range itself can be tuned. So using the same device, you can work between 450 till 750, or you can work on the infrared. Which means you can make a, a ellipsometric measurement. You can turn a cell phone into imaging ellipsometer. And if you combine it with uh, uh, spectrometer or tunable filter, you can make a spectroscopic ellipsometer, which is useful for thin films uh, characterization. And of course, biosensor. This is an example of a device we did both in reflection, reflection, transmission, and here connected a chromatic wave plate connected to a cell phone. And we got we get a variety of images, applications in biometry, dermatology, and the comparison here to a standard image when you shine light from the side and look for the scattering. That's what you see. But when you do it, you do the polarimetric imaging, you start to see the fingerprint. And the same, you can do it in archaeology applications, remote sensing, and so on. Of course, multispectral can have many applications. Here we show only two of them for food inspection, looking at an apple with some defect. So you can identify it with certain wavelengths, but not the others, again, with remote sensing. Um, how much time I have? Uh, well, we, how many slides do you have? Uh, maybe we can finish soon, if that's okay. Yeah, I will try maybe, I will skip a few of them. These are less miniature devices, let's see what's called parallel face. They can be miniaturized, but as of now, 
hope you are bulky. So then to arrive to the something more relevant, and that's the plasmonic sensors. So as mentioned, we worked with extended plasmons, meaning using a thin film combined with a prism or a grating in this case. So we looked at the extended plasmon versus wavelength or angle. As mentioned, when you look at the wavelengths, these are like the temporal frequency. And when we look at the angle, this is the spatial frequency. So we, in both cases, we actually, we look at them with a camera, right? Spectrometry is also like a camera with a grating or a prism. And here we look with a camera on the angular distribution. So we see a dark line on a bright background and each line corresponds to one resonance. As you can see, you can make it even multi-channel. This shows the line for DI water. This is uh, another uh, coil and this is a glue in between. And um, we, you improve the measurement here because if you, you might remember the old SPR have been doing, have been scanning the light source over quite large angular range. Besides being bulky, it's also expensive and you need mechanical movement. So here we don't need to scan anything. It's miniature. You can have this as a cell phone camera. And we did it. We demonstrated also a cell phone. <coughs> um, and you improve the precision. Why? Because if you go in this direction, you make cross section. This is actually like one angular scan. But you have as many scans as the number of columns. So the number of columns is the n, large n. So you actually improve your precision by the square root of the number of columns. Of course, now you have an image and you can process it. You can do average. You can improve the measurement. So you improve your detection limit. We also worked with, uh, I mean, here we worked with a variety of modes, not only simple SPR, but the idea was how to improve the SPR. So here we show that it is possible to improve the width of the SPR line. Uh, in particular, when you work in the near infrared, for example, at 1500, sometimes you need it for detecting large uh, bioentities like bacteria because the larger wavelengths give larger penetration depth. okay so with a spectrometer and the near infrared now you will be able to get a better figure of merit and uh, with it you can detect bacteria as well this one then we said okay near infrared spectrometers are expensive. We need something in the visible. And to do that, to be able to control the penetration depth in the visible range, we went to this structure where we have two dielectric layers and the metal in between. And we gain two things actually. One is the fact that we have one plasmon on the bottom of the layer, which is fixed. This one here is not changing as we vary the refractive index. So we can use it as a reference. So we get a self-reference measurement. This one shifts a lot. Here, this is for air, and this is for liquids like uh, water and above. Becomes very narrow also. So it means you can improve your precision in determining the line. But also very narrow, it means you will get, the, it's coming from the fact that the plasmon is propagating a lot along the surface. 
that's because it's far away from the metal. Far away from the metal, it means it's penetrating more inside the analyte. So we get this large penetration dip. So as you see here, it's like uh, six microns penetration, while usually you get something like 200 nanometers. So the 200 nanometers are good to get the specificity even for viruses, for molecules, proteins, and so on. But when we have bacteria or a biofilm, it is difficult to get a monotonic signal. So you need the larger penetration tip. And here we can do that by varying the wavelength. So again, we can combine this with a filter or simply using two wavelengths and measuring at two wavelengths, one good for small bioentities and one uh, for large ones. These are grating modes we also improved here. Again, self-reference. What's good with the grating is that it is much more miniature than using a prism, right? You can easily read it. Usually it's more spectral. So you can design, design it to work with a visible range and uh, work with the cell phone quite easily. And it's also self-referenced. We have this uh, property here. Um, a variety of papers, you can, you can read it. And we proved it experimentally. Uh, we need to start commercializing it, hopefully very soon. Of course, you can improve the reading uh, much more. For example, using the face SPR. And we, we did that with a variety of techniques, using a rotating polarizer, using a liquid crystal variable retarder, and using a chromatic wave plate. Is <coughs> here as can you, you can see, when you use a wave plate, which gives a half wave, you see it's similar to the face profile. So you get this kind of sharp, jump okay but to, to extract the face you need these three measurements one at half wave plate one quarter wave one full wave and then you can extract what's called sine tube psi from ellipsometry it's the ratio between the tm to the te polarization amplitudes and cosine delta delta is the phase difference between the two polarizations okay which will give the sharp, sharp signal by the end. So it improves the precision. So we put it, put it all together in a miniature system. You cannot compare, of course, to Biacor because this contains many other things, but the principle is clear. The idea is that we first went to this size, like 13, centimeters height, and now it's five centimeter height. And we have it designed for three millimeter, three centimeters height, so it can fit easily under a microscope. And it weighs less than one kilogram. If we want to incorporate with a cell phone, we can get rid of the camera and put a slot here for a cell phone. <clears throat> for a cell phone, it will also reduce the size, okay? So it is possible to connect it to a cell phone and maybe do all the processing with the application uh, using a cell phone. For now, it works with a PC or laptop. As you can see here, connected to a pump, it's uh, two channels. It can be made even multi-channel. I don't know if that's important, but it shows you one example of uh, a sensogram as you start to vary the concentration of glycerol uh, in water with small variations in the concentration. Then as you go back to the 
for the water, the signal will go back uh, to the same level, as you can see. Okay. And we'll stop this. Okay. Uh, just a quick, I mean, nanoplasmonics, you all know. We get this enhancement near the tip of nanoparticles. We worked mainly with um, films which are prepared using oblique angle deposition because then you get a large area and they are relatively cheap, easy to prepare. We get enhancement in fluorescence and we quantify it, quantified it even with a spectrometer. We used it for uh, bacteria detection here. And then we also performed SERS and optimized the structure uh, for SERS detection. As you can see, we use a very miniature system. It's a very simple probe connected with a fiber to device which contain both the light source, the laser and the spectrometer in one box. The probe, as uh, promised before, it looks like this. You have the laser, it goes through a one filter to make it uh, more clean from other frequencies that might come from the laser. And then go through a dichroic filter focused on the sample and the scattered light is collected and reflected with the dichroic filter to the other channel, which goes to the spectrometer. So this way you get uh, the Raman spectrum. And with this, we did sensing of bacteria, of biomarker in water for ADCs called VG protein, uh, which uh, exists in, in water. Its existence means the water contains some endocrine disruptor. We have a way to improve the signal enhancement even more, even more by coupling the extended plasmon with the localized one, which means instead of shining light directly on the structure, we first excite the first wave, the extended plasmon. So we already have some enhancement here, some concentration of the light. And because of that, now you excite the localized one, you get even higher enhancement. So it's, we expect it to be multiplication of the two enhancement factors. In reality, we get even more. And that's because the particle, when it's close to the metal, there is an effect called uh, mirror charge, which gives even higher enhancement. And we demonstrated that uh, <clears throat> sorry, by shining light through a prism under the condition of the extended plasmon. So you see the large enhancement at the specific angle. And outside that angle, you get very little enhancement. So it is demonstrated here with Raman and with uh, fluorescence. So my main idea was that we can combine that miniature system by having nanoparticles on top, then you can measure both SPR and from top we can have enhanced fluorescence on Raman. Maybe we're looking at through a microscope. It can make a nice uh, multimodal uh, sensing system. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ibrahim, for this uh, great lecture. And uh, very, very relevant for Ipanema to have uh, really focus on miniaturized uh, sensors because of our um, goal to have the point of care application. So thank you once again for this. Uh, I will stop now the recording.